good day, everybody, and welcome to our celebration of National Seniors Day. We are asking the question, how to make Canada more age inclusive? We're delighted to celebrate this important day with folks from around this country, coast to coast to coast. This session is co-hosted and co-presented by CanAge and our friends at Help Age Canada. And we'll hear a little bit more from Help Age Canada and some of the great initiatives that they're engaging in in a few minutes. We also really wanna thank our sponsors. It's critically important that we make sure that all of these opportunities are free of charge to people and our sponsors make that possible. So again, thank you too much for our sponsors. When we're celebrating National Seniors Day, we know that it takes a village and we wanna share with you our specific thanks to our co-hosts today. These are organizations from across the country who are committed to making Canada more age inclusive and we wanna make sure that we spend a special shout out and thanks to you. A few minutes of housekeeping as we're all getting used to Zoom. I just wanna let you know that the attendees microphones and videos will be turned off. We invite you to go into that little box that has you in it and go up into the top right hand corner if you're on a computer, it could be the very top if you're on an iPad, you'll see a moat that says mute and then three dots. We invite you to hit those three dots, scroll down where it says rename and you are gonna to wanna to rename yourself. And you may also wanna put your organization's name in there. So we invite you to rename yourself we have a little bit of uh, details on how to adjust the video size of your speakers if you like. And I just want to share with you that we are broadcasting live on Facebook and that this webinar will be recorded and posted on all of our partner sites as well as our own site as well. So you can share this wonderful information. We encourage everyone to use the chat box. You'll see that there is a, a chat box there. Please tell us who you are and where you're from. And we also we encourage you to use the Q&A box. We will be having some of our team members monitor the Q&A box and we'll be able to share those questions. So do feel free to reach out and engage in the chat with a, a little bit of fun back and forth. Let us know where you are and share any resources that you may have in that chat box. If you have a question for the panelists, please put it in the Q&A box. We are gonna have a little super quick evaluation afterwards and we do ask that you please just spend that two seconds and fill in our evaluation. In the way of the world, particularly in the way of COVID-19, so much of this is being captured on social media. And we would love it if you would use these hashtags of National Seniors Day, Can Age Seniors and Age Inclusive in your own hashtags as well. I just wanna share with you a very brief agenda. So we are so delighted today to have a wonderful journalist, Cynthia Mulligan, who has been a leading voice in the issues of seniors. We'll then move to Carrie Baisley, who's bringing us a welcome from our Métis colleagues and friends. We're delighted to have the Honorable Deb Schulte, who is of course our Federal Minister of Seniors, and we're very grateful for her time today. We're then delighted to offer our guest presenter, Vickery Bowles, who's our city librarian in the Toronto Public Library, and she's got some exciting announcements. We'll then move to our panelists and into our expert roundtable. We're asking each one of them, through the moderation of uh, Carrie, Cynthia Mulligan, how do we make Canada more age inclusive? We'll then engage in a bit more of a back and forth and answer your questions. We'll have some resources as well for you at the end. And we want to make sure that you know how to stay in touch with us. I'm not going to engage in full bios because the experts that we have on today are you know, astounding in the work that they have done. So you have the bio circulated, but I'm just going to hit a couple of top line issues. Cynthia Mulligan is an accomplished journalist who's worked in Toronto for more than 25 years. She has done it all. She shoots, she records, she does expert analysis, particularly in the area of politics. And she's incredibly known for her award-winning work in the 2015 coverage of the terrorist attacks in Paris. We know Cynthia as well because of her constant and compassionate engagement on behalf of older Canadians and has been really acknowledged as a leading expert voice in bringing the role of Canadians who are older adults or their family members in the forefront during the time of COVID-19. 
I'm so very grateful to introduce to you one of my dear friends today, Carrie Baisley. And Carrie has really specialized in relations between patients and families and family members and practitioners. He has worked in many, many different areas. He has ranged as a social development officer in the Yukon to the head of client relations and risk management at Vancouver Coastal Health. He's worked as a coach. He has worked in the public guardian trustee's office. And Carrie is also at the front lines of the COVID response in Lynn Valley. Most importantly, Carrie is today to bring and share with us a little bit of his heritage and make sure that we acknowledge the importance of um, our treaty and non-treaty issues with regards to people and particularly within the Métis environment. We know that Vickery is a well-known face in Canada and not just because as a Torontonian, but as a person who has been running, you know, the largest library system across North America. She serves about 3 million residents through 100 branches and the online network. She's been actively committed to making sure that older people and libraries are age inclusive. And we're so excited to have you here today, Vickery. Greg Shaw is a well-known figure in this area and, and a director of the, um, the International Federation on Aging. I can't emphasize how Greg's expertise, both in the area of aging as well as administration of health systems, has informed our COVID response in Canada. He has a deep and robust background in the field, but one of the things that I'm going to ask him to share is about issues of public health today. Margaret Gillis has kind of done it all, and she has come as a champion of rights and civil rights and human rights, having now been the founding president of the International Longevity Center of Canada. And before that, she's worked on age-friendly communities, really driving that narrative in Canada and around the world. Kahir Laji has her, his own expertise in the field of aging and wears many, many hats. When you have looked to see one of the incredible sets of responses from the United Way in this time of COVID-19, you may not have seen that it was Kahir leading so many of those engagements, working 24-7 to make sure that people on the ground had the support and the help that they needed. He serves both as Executive Director of the United Way of the Southern Interior BC and the Provincial Director of Population Health of the United Way of the Lower Mainland. We're so delighted to have United Way with us today. Alex Mahalanis is very well known in the field of aging, but also brings a subspeciality in terms of science and innovation. He's the CEO and scientific co-director of AgeWell, which is Canada's networks of centers of excellence in aging and really technology issues. He wears many other hats as well. And on top of that, he now also wears a hat representing the University of Toronto globally and supporting research and innovation. I'm also so pleased to introduce to you Gregor Snen, who is our partner and co-presenter today. Gregor is the executive director of Help Age Canada, and many of us have seen the innovation and engagement that Help Age Canada has shown as they have responded on the ground in real time to the crisis of COVID-19, including with micro grants to help people who have been in need in this country. I am your other co-host, and I am the CEO of CanAge. Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization, and I'm so delighted today to have you and to be here with you today. At this point, it is my, uh, my pure pleasure to introduce Gregor Snedden, and Gregor will introduce the Honourable Deb Schulte, our Minister of Seniors. Gregor, over to you. Thank you, uh, Laura. Well, Deb Schulte is an accomplished leader and community advocate, a former regional councillor of the city of Vaughan, and a consummate professional who holds a degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. Before entering federal political life in 2015, she had 22 years of engineering and business experience with Bombardier, and in her role as Minister of Seniors alongside her cabinet colleagues and the Government of Canada, she's working to improve Canadian seniors' quality of life. Earlier this month, she announced over a thousand new community projects to provide pandemic support to seniors, like virtual classes and the delivery of medication, uh, much of that through the New Horizons program. And as we all heard from the speech from the throne, the government is committed to several critical me measures for seniors, increasing old age security once a senior turns 75, setting national standards for long-term care, and accelerating steps to achieve national universal pharmacare. 
Minister Schulte continues to move these initiatives forward and works to support organizations like Help Age Canada and all of us across Canada to support Canadian seniors. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Canada's Minister of Seniors, Deb Schulte. Thank you very much, Gregor, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Laura, and, and the KenAge team for organizing this event for your, and for your leadership on seniors' issues. It's a really, I'm really thrilled to be here virtually with all of you and with such a distinguished panel and le leaders on the seniors, uh, seniors' front. I, I really do thank you for doing this, uh, especially on National Seniors' Day. So happy National Seniors' Day to all of you. This is an occasion where we celebrate everything that they've done for us, for our families, and for our communities. Seniors are the lifeblood of our communities. As the average age of senior volunteers is twice as many hours as our younger Canadians uh, do in terms of volunteering. So they are truly the backbone of our volunteer networks. There's no more appropriate day to come together to talk about how to make Canada more age inclusive. The Government of Canada is committed to doing just that and to working with provinces and territories and all of the organizations that are supporting seniors because so many of the issues can only be resolved if we all work together. During the pandemic, seniors have been staying safe and staying home and that's made them more isolated and more vulnerable and disconnected from their communities and their loved ones. We cannot allow physical distancing to become social distancing. So the government is helping ensure seniors get support and stay connected during the pandemic through our New Horizons for Seniors program. Early in the pandemic, we let organizations that receive the funding change their projects to support seniors in new ways. And we use the United Ways network to quickly bring forward new projects. And this fall, we launch additional projects. All told, we funded over 2,000 community-based projects across the country to provide pandemic support to seniors. Many of these projects have helped seniors to connect online for the very first time by providing tablets and other devices, getting help on how they can use them, and to provide group activities like exercise classes. Others help seniors continue to access critical services like medical appointments and food. We've heard loud and clear from seniors that the biggest issue they face is financial security. From the beginning, our government has worked hard to strengthen seniors' finances. We restored the age of eligibility for old age security and guaranteed income supplement to 65 from 67 years. And that put thousands of dollars back into the pockets of seniors. We increased guaranteed income supplement by $947, improving the financial security of over 900,000 single seniors. To help working seniors keep more of their benefits, we increase the GIS earnings exemption so seniors can earn up to $5,000 without any reduction in benefits. And we strengthen the CPP to provide up to 50% more benefit for future retirees. Looking ahead, we will increase the old age security once a senior turns 75 and will boost the Canada Pension Plan survivors benefit. To help seniors access housing that meets their needs, we're building at least 7,000 new affordable units for seniors, as well as investing in much needed renovations. Under the, and this is all under the national housing strategy. I wanna say a few words about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. Our four biggest provinces, in our four biggest provinces, the second wave isn't just starting, it's underway already. While the first wave was hard on everyone, it's, it was especially hard on seniors because they are at a higher risk from the virus. I want to assure you that the health and safety of Canadians, especially our older Canadians, is our number one priority. And that's why the Government of Canada acted early. Over two months ago, we renegotiated or negotiated a safe restart agreement with the provinces that is investing and territories, that is investing $19 billion dollars to protect the health of Canadians. The agreement bolsters the capacity of provinces and territories to conduct contact tracing and testing with a goal to have a capacity of up to 200,000 tests a day across the country. This is vital to containing future outbreaks quickly before they spread. 
To better protect seniors in long-term care homes, we're funding infection prevention measures and expanding eligibility for federal infrastructure funds so they can be used to modernize and renovate long-term care facilities. We set up a contingency reserve of personal protective equipment so frontline and essential workers have the vital protection they need to do their jobs. The federal government is also creating a temporary national sick leave program so no one will feel pressured to go to work when they're sick. Throughout these difficult times, Canadians have stood together to look out for one another and protect our communities. And our government will continue to ensure that Canadians have the supports to stay safe and get through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And we know your day is very charged and that you have a time that you have to head out to question period. And so with that, we're so grateful that you've agreed to take a few questions and Cynthia Mulligan will pose a few questions to you at this point, again, helping us to better understand the work of how Canada can be more age inclusive. Cynthia, over to you. My apologies. Laura, am I not supposed to introduce Carrie Baisley for the Métis Welcome First? So I will do that in just a moment. Minister, uh, I look forward to having a couple of questions with you and thank you again so very much for your time. And I know we all know that you have to leave by around noon because you're running into the legislature and you have a lot of important work to be doing. So thank you very, very much. And it's nice to see you again. Not so long ago, we did something very similar to this with CanAge and the remarkable Laura Tamblin Watts, who is leading the way on, on making this a better country for seniors to live in. And uh, kudos for your work on creating a roadmap to do that. And it's a really important strategy so that we all have goals that we can, we can work towards. Um, as a journalist, I've been covering COVID, of course, uh, intensely and long-term care, uh, I've been watching with, with great distress. Uh, the very sad part is, is that this has been in the making for decades and uh, it should not have come as a surprise to anyone. A lot of people have been raising the alarm bells about issues in long-term care for many, many years. Uh, it's a little personal for me as well. Not only have I met a lot of people impacted, um, I have an 81 year old mother. She's not in long-term care, but she lives alone and, and she's lonely. And it's a real problem with our seniors. So um, I look forward to this next hour and a bit, and we can tackle these very relevant issues uh, about how to make life better for all of our seniors. So thank you all for being here. And it's such an honor to be asked uh, to be a part of it in, in some small way. But first, I'd like to introduce Carrie Baisley. Carrie, hello. And uh, you are going to give us uh, a Métis welcome. Yes, sure. So, uh, before there was the government of Canada, where there were the Indigenous and Métis people of the country. So, welcome to Seniors Day 2020. My name is Carrie Baisley. I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation, British Columbia. My ma maternal Métis heritage comes from the Swampy Cree. My paternal Métis heritage comes from Gaelic speakers, originally from the Orkneys. I'm speaking to you today from Vancouver, Coast, Vancouver General Hospital, located on the unsurrendered homelands of the Coast Salish nations, including the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil Take a moment and be thankful for the hospitality and generosity of the Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis people that enables all of us to live in this place we currently call Canada. The Métis and many Indigenous people started day or a gathering by giving thanks. Thanks for the Creator and the gift of creation, for Mother Earth and all the creatures we live with here, those that fly and swim and walk and crawl. We also remember all those who have passed. As this is the first Seniors Day in the age of COVID-19, we remember and hold dear all those who have died and remember their families also. We are reminded we are always part of creation, the earth and each other. Those include the intricate links that connect us past, present and future. Today, we are exploring how to make Canada more age inclusive. Inclusiveness should be expanded from words into timely actions, both individual and collective. 
I'll close with these words by Richard, Richard Wagamese. There is a song that is Canada. You can hear it in the brush and tree and rock. There is an ancient note in its choruses. Voices sprung from Métis roots, Ojibwe, Cree, Mi'kmaq, and then the French, German, Scottish, and English. It's a magnificent cacophony. I have learned that to love this country means to love its people, all of them. When we say all my relations, it's meant in a teaching way to rekindle community. We are part of the great grand circle of humanity and we need each other. It wouldn't be Canada with one voice less. All my relations. Thank you so much. Such beautiful, meaningful words. Thank you for sharing. Really appreciate that. Uh, Gregor Snedden, now I'm going to hand it over to you to take it away from here. Uh, well, actually, I think it's over back to Minister Schulte. Laura, would you like to uh, direct us on that? Thank you so much. Exactly. And we're so pleased that the minister does have a few times for some questions. And so, Minister, we were wondering from you, certainly when it comes to questions of long-term care, it has been on the top of everyone's mind. And we heard comments from the throne speech quite unusually about something that usually is in a provincial area, but there's long been calls for things like national standards. Can we have a bit of more information from you about your thinking about the role of long-term care and seniors, which has played such an important and in many cases, devastating role in our time in COVID-19? Thanks, Laura. Um, just having a little trouble coming off a mute there. And I just want to start by saying thank you very much to Carrie for, uh, for doing the uh, acknowledgement and sharing the wisdom that he did. Um, it's, it's really important uh, that we do that. And I am sorry that I kicked off my comments before uh, having that uh, done properly. Uh, and I just, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's so important that we do, do we do it right and we kick off this session in a good way. So thank you, Carrie. Um, it, is, it is obviously uh, an issue when you mentioned, Laura, about long-term care that has shocked the nation. Uh, I know, as uh, Cynthia said, it should not be shocking. And you also said these things have been burbling under the surface for some time. But I think having to bring in our military to help look after seniors was a wake-up call for Canadians. And to have the report that they wrote on the... Uh, the circumstances that they found some seniors in what was truly shocking and, uh, and it is uh, spurring action. And this is something that in the early in the pandemic, it was important to get the, the supports in there that we could obviously with the military where we were asked to go in, we did. And, uh, and I really am very proud of our, our services for our, 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 uh, Canadian Forces for stepping up and, and being there in a very large way. We also knew that protective equipment was a challenge. So right in the early days, we saw the shortages around the world. And so we stepped up with billions of dollars to purchase and use all of the power that we could as the Canadian procurement to get access using leverage of all of our partners around the world to make sure that we could get the support in protective equipment that we needed. And we are continuing to make investments there. On top of the billions previously, additional billions are going in to make sure that Canadians can get the protective equipment they need, uh, especially those on the front lines uh, in these in these long term care facilities. We also know that the the workers, uh, personal support workers in particular, were left very vulnerable. Uh, some of these uh, facilities uh, were making management decisions that were putting them at risk, and they were not uh, rewarded or or properly compensated for the work that they were doing. So we we stepped up and put $3 billion on the table with provinces and territories to help essential frontline workers very early on. 
and uh, we've seen some of that money go out to support uh, long-term care workers. We're just hearing announcements in some of the provinces that they are they're stepping up and doing that to make sure that we have the resources and the people on on in the long-term care facilities and on the front lines as we move into the second wave that we're now seeing. And and that we're very concerned, and all Canadians should be concerned because uh, we we need those workers, we need those people to be doing those essential jobs, and many of them did exceptional jobs they truly were heroes on the front line when this covid came out uh, and and i think cynthia mentioned she has a, a mom uh, an older mom so do i i have an 86 eight, coming up to 87 year old uh, mom who lives on her own and uh, and is is challenged uh, up there uh, in where she lives uh, i also had uh, a mother-in-law who was in a long-term care facility. So our family experienced the challenges that many families experienced. She was in an excellent long-term care facility that worked very hard to make sure that we stayed connected, but we couldn't hold her. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't be with her when she passed. It, it was very, very difficult for everyone. And I feel for the Canadians that have uh, been dealing with this, with their loved ones in long-term care facilities, in seniors' residences, because this isn't just uh, an issue for long-term care. It's an, in an issue for the whole regime of supporting our seniors that are needing support in their homes, supporting our seniors in seniors residences and making sure that we have the supports uh, to protect them and to to keep them safe and as was mentioned reach out and make sure that they're not um, isolated in these facilities and while they're staying safe at home so you, you talked a little bit about some of the things that i'm just sort of um sharing with you some of the things that we've already done. Obviously, we are putting more money on the table with the Safe Restart uh, agreements that we made with the provinces and territories, and that's where you're seeing additional funding now coming out. But going forward, there's more that needs to be done, clearly. There was a there was a call across the country, a uh, call to action for national standards uh, that would assist these homes in terms of being able to uh, provide the appropriate care to keep our seniors safe. And so this is where the government's going to be working with the provinces and territories to move forward in that in that regard. Uh, we also um, will be, uh, you know, doing uh, additional steps uh, to to support where the provinces need more support. PPE, uh, we did, as you said, as you mentioned, uh, or as I mentioned before, uh, we are looking at the keeping people safe uh, by keeping them home when they're feeling sick. So if they don't have a, a sick days program uh, and coverage for that, we will be supporting them. So there's, there's a lot of programs that we're moving forward on to help Canadians stay safe. And this will help those that are in long-term care as well. Thank you. Minister, if I could pose one question to you. Um, because of COVID, the plight of seniors and, and, and the state of long-term care homes and how, how our seniors are living in this country is at the forefront. Um, my concern though is, is that will be temporary. How do you keep that momentum going uh, across the country? I mean, there was justifiable outrage when the military had to move in and we saw those distressing uh, reports from the frontline military, but, but I worry that, that, you know, the interest will wane as we get into the second wave, as we get post-COVID and people are trying to rebuild the economy. How do you guarantee that, that this will stay in the forefront and we will actually make a, a difference far beyond COVID? Well, I, I really thank you for that question because uh, you're right. Sometimes um, issues uh, arise in a crisis and then when the crisis is over, uh, you know, the, the impetus to do something uh, wanes. So, but as you can see through the throne speech, the federal government has stepped up to say we are going to implement certain measures to help so that in the long term, we have uh, a better uh, regime for long term care to operate so that we can ensure or, you know, help to ensure that these uh, horrific issues and, and circumstances don't happen again. But it is also 
an obligation for the public to stay engaged and to call out their leaders and their politicians to make sure that they're, they're making the right choices and making choices that keep keep investing in long-term care. So this is, you know, it's a call to the public as well to get engaged and get interested and to to call and hold their call their politicians out and also to hold their politicians accountable for the uh, for the ambitions that have been put on the table. So I'm definitely um, eager to be moving forward. As you know, it is a, it's a sector that's regulated by provinces and territories. So we will be working with the provinces and territories to set a framework for a better future for long-term care. Do you think a societal shift needs to take place? Um, there was one woman in long-term care in her late 80s who I did a Zoom interview with and she had been locked inside her long-term care for months. And she said to me, you know, we, we, we are not disposable and yet we're being treated as disposable once we reach a certain age. Does this country need to do a complete shift in our thinking about our elders and, and how we value them? Well, thank you. Uh, and, and just, you know, to talk about circumstances, it's been very difficult uh, for these facilities, uh, you know, seniors residence is long term care to try to balance the needs of seniors to be with their families and to be social, uh, but also to keep them safe uh, when people can be coming and going who may be carriers of this disease and wouldn't even know that they are. So there's been a lot of protocol that's been put in place. We made recommendations in the early days on how they could do this but it has had consequences for seniors where they were in lockdown and some that were in outbreak where they were isolated uh, because they couldn't have family members come in or even those that would come in normally to provide support to them which has, has reduced their you know support levels so these are very uh, challenging times for all those that are working to try and keep seniors safe but I think you know your conversations today are really shining a spotlight on on the need for us to look at how we uh, support seniors better in the days going forward and you've brought forward or at least uh, can age has brought forward a, a long list of recommendations how we could do that and our government has been listening uh, to all the stakeholders and seniors that are uh, giving us advice on how we can do better in supporting them as they want to age more in their homes they want to to have more tools to be able to to stay safe uh, and to connect with communities and uh, and we are doing that we're doing that through some of the measures that i already talked about in my introduction with the New Horizons for Seniors. Uh, if there's, and there isn't really a silver lining in this pandemic, but it has spurred some seniors to get online and to get uh, savvy uh, with help from those in the community. And I just give you an example of some, even my mother, uh, but some seniors that have shared with me, they were very nervous about getting online. This has forced them to get online, uh, to do Zoom, just like we're doing today, to be able to stay connected with their exercise classes and their community members. But it's also given them the opportunity to connect with family members in other countries that they were only doing through, you know, the snail mail, uh, or never being able to really share the pictures and the experiences in in real time with their family members, and they are they are really telling me how much it has changed their lives. So, so there are, there are uh, there's a lot we can be doing to support seniors better, and that's part of what you're talking about today, and part of what our government is committed to doing. Thank you, Minister. Thank you so very much for your time. You've stayed beyond even what we had hoped, so we do appreciate it. We know that you have to. Uh, be off and join the legislature. And on behalf of all of us, our condolences about your mother-in-law. And I'm so sorry to hear that you as well went through that pain of not being able to be there with her and for her. So we do, we do feel your sorrow on that. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, I just want, I'm going to ask the minister to say just for a few minutes to hear a wonderful announcement and a thank you on behalf of our next presenter, Vickery Bowles, the chief librarian of the Toronto Public Library. Vickery, over to you. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Minister, for sharing your thoughts on the 30th anniversary of Seniors Month and the importance of supporting older adults in our communities. And I also want to thank uh, 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 CanAge and HelpAge Canada for inviting me to participate in this wonderful celebration of seniors today. 
The ways in which people are living and aging today, particularly in the country's urban centers, is creating unique challenges, but it's also creating opportunities. And so it's requiring us to think differently about library services and how we should be delivering those services and the ways in which we deliver them. So uh, many of Canada's aging adults don't have easy access to free, accessible public spaces and services, both physical and virtual, where they can work, learn, relax, and come together within their community. And this has become even more acute with the social, economic, climate, and technological disruptions we're experiencing today. And Minister Schulte was talking a little bit uh, just a moment ago about how seniors are accessing technology more uh, to improve their lives. And certainly uh, digital literacy and access to digital technology technology are so important and a real focus of public libraries across this, this country um, in helping seniors and many older Canadians who are, um, to deal with, the, with the, this sense of uh, social isolation and the lack of community connection, which is really impacting their resilience and ability to thrive. And so I'm really thrilled to be able to announce this morning on a day that we are celebrating National Seniors Day. And as it happens, it's also the beginning of National Public Library Month. So I couldn't think of a better time to be doing this. Um, announcing a new strategic partnership between Toronto Public Library and CanAge. By bringing together the leadership and resources of North America's biggest and busiest public library system and Canada's nonpartisan, nonprofit seniors advocacy organization, we hope to create more opportunities to make Canada more age inclusive and ensure that Canada's seniors are able to thrive and live in a vibrant, connected and meaningful lives with equitable access as to the resources they need to thrive. We also hope to create a Canada-wide understanding of the vital role that libraries play in providing the spaces and services, tools and supports that help build the success, resilience and well-being for Canada's aging populations. By coming together, it's our hope and our belief that we can increase our collective impact and change seniors' lives for the better. Thank you so very much for inviting me to participate today and uh, make this wonderful announcement about our, our new strategic partnership. And now I'd like to turn things over uh, back to Cynthia Mulligan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that wonderful announcement. And now we are going to hear from each of our expert panels who bring a unique perspective to this topic. How do we make uh, this country a better place for all seniors to live and each has a unique perspective and view and so much knowledge to bring to this discussion as so we're keeping it each of our panelists will be speaking for five minutes uh, Minister Schultz, Schulte thank you so very much you're waving goodbye we do appreciate your time and thank you and we hope to hear and have another discussion with you again in the future thank you so let's bring in our first panelist, Kahir. I'm going to start with you, um, and we've, I've heard you speak before, and I'm really looking forward to your thoughts on this topic today. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia and Helpage and Kani, for, for putting together this panel on, on this very, I think, special day. I wanted to start off today to talk a little bit about the work that we do um, in helping to mobilize, and I would say inspire action. Uh, in service to creating healthy, accessible, and inclusive communities. And we do, this by, we do this by listening, we do this by engaging, and we do this by, by learning, by learning from communities across the country. And one of the first things that we heard over the course of the last couple of years as we started to be more intentional in our community development is that age and aging means different things to different people. And this is sometimes based on your cumulative life experience. And often what we found is that one's perspective and perception of age and aging is directly correlated to community and the role that community plays in creating accessible and inclusive communities. And when I say community, I mean a few different things. Community can be identified as a geographical boundary where when we wanted to go in and provide programs and service and services in a small village of 300, we realized we needed to start off by 
making sure they had access to Wi-Fi to be more accessible and inclusive. When we talk about community, we talk about a group of people that are bound by shared values and beliefs. When we talk about community, we talk about people that share historical experiences, often of oppression. And these different definitions of community collectively contribute to the way one experiences life throughout their life course, is what we've heard. And as a result of that influences the way one perceives aging. Through the work that we've done, we've understood that, you know, depend, regardless of what year one is born in, functional age is becoming increasingly important. How one feels, how one is engaged in their community, connect, connected in their community, how active one is in their community. And some of the work that we've done over the last years is developing what we call a community-based services sector for seniors, which includes a number of organizations, nonprofits, senior centers, multi-service agencies that do incredible work in their communities, working with people of all ages, of all abilities, of all life experiences to hear about programs and services that might be relevant to them. And for us, it's incredibly important to hear from the voices of people that live in their communities around services, programs, policies, even often the built environment that needs to be considered uh, when, when looking at the different levels of abilities and ages in their communities. And we do this through authentic community development work. And the programs and services that we offer are aimed to cut across ages, cut across abilities, cut across life experiences, and foster people to be active, connected, and engaged regardless of their uh, stage of life. Whether it's an elder that I had the incredible honor of meeting uh, about 18 months ago that lives in a rural community in, in Northern Canada. And when I went to meet her, um, I was greeted by her 68-year-old son who had what I like to say um, was emotionally fragile and lived in a small shed uh, on the property. And when I entered the home, I met this elder who had not left her home for two years. And she had kyphosis, so a, a really significant uh, curve in her spine. And she, you know those wire hangers? She had tied a number of wire hangers together. And when I entered her home, she was reaching into her dryer to try and get her laundry out with this string of wired hangers. Eight months later, the organization in that community was able to develop a relationship with both her and her son. And when I went to visit her eight months later, she was teaching yoga three times a week at the local senior center. And for us, it was so profound to understand the value, the contributions, the wisdom and the skills that all people have regardless of their age, and how community really fosters a sense of belonging. You know, I met, uh, I met a gentleman, Mr. Zen, who I have permission to use his name, who runs a men's shed in, in one of our communities. And he traditionally was not engaged in community. Men generally, 95% uh, of people that, that attend nonprofit community-based programs are, are, are women. And so he decided to convert his garage to a men's shed. And when I went to speak with him, he told me how there was a group of children in their community that had a garage full of tools and donated it to the men's shed. And they co-created wooden canes and wooden carvings. And we saw, we saw the sharing of, of, of knowledge, of time, of talent. And this gentleman actually said that this initiative prevented him from committing suicide. And we see the role that community has in, in enhancing the quality of life of people across all ages. I'll end just with saying, it is our belief that it is our collective responsibility to rethink aging from the perspective of supporting all people to thrive across the life course. Cynthia, I'll hand it back to you. I was so wrapped up in your story, I forgot that I was still on mute. Um, that was very powerful stories. Thank you very much uh, for your 
incredible perspective, Kahir. Uh, our next panelist that I'm going to introduce is Margaret Gillis. Uh, she is with the International Longevity Center. Margaret, we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to CanAge and to HelpAge Canada for this opportunity. Thank you to the minister and to the other distinguished speakers for your participation in what is for all of us a very busy day. Um, like no other time in Canadian history, the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated the need for a human rights response to the question, what can we do to make Canada more age inclusive? While the grim statistics should be enough with more than 80% of the deaths in Canada from COVID happening in long-term care, it's the images now burned in our memory that beg for true compassion and a swift human rights-based response. Who can forget the media reports of older people left in their beds to die of the virus without medical aid, older people dying of dehydration or malnutrition in the middle of our Canadian cities, or the images of families of older persons outside a care facility hoping to catch a glimpse of a loved one and frantic about the impact the social isolation was going to have on their family member or the workers in long-term care facilities who moved in or risked their own lives and those of their families to provide care, sometimes without proper protective equipment. A year ago, I doubt any of us would believe that the Canadian military would release a report of unimaginable misery and neglect of older vulnerable people, not that took place in some faraway country requiring peacekeepers, but here in Canada, with our sophisticated healthcare system and laws against age discrimination. Yet it happened here, and it will happen again if we don't take the steps to ensure that Canada becomes more age inclusive. This is not the responsibility of one level of government, of one group. It's a societal change that depends on all of us, and it demands a human rights response. We must stand solidar in solidarity against ageism, fight for the dignity of all Canadians and respect the basic human rights of all citizens, regardless of age. So how do we become a more age inclusive society? Of course, there are many ways and we know that the impressive array of speakers today are going to share many of them with you. But for my part, I will advocate that we have a great opportunity here to respond in a most Canadian way, a way that reflects our long and strong history of respecting and preserving human rights. Let us have Canada lead and support a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Older Persons. It is generally agreed that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the foundation of international human rights law. And as many of you may be aware, it was drafted by a Canadian, John Peters Humphrey. In addition, a series of human rights treaties adopted since 1945 have expanded the body of human rights law, uh, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, all of which Canada had a strong lead leadership and supporting role. Yet we have no convention on the rights of older persons, like there are for women, children, and people with disabilities. And the pandemic has clearly showed us that we need one. So I'd like to take a quick moment to tell you how a convention is an opportunity to make Canada more age inclusive. Well, first of all, it's a method to achieve positive change by combating ageism, um, guiding policy making, improving accountability of governments at all levels, educating and empowering older people, and seeing older people as rights holders uh, with binding protection under international law. It could protect us from discrimination and allow older people to have equal opportunities to live independent lives. It allows us to defend our human rights when we get older. Now, there have been some positive news in our work to secure a convention on the rights of old persons. In 2018, International Longevity Center Canada brought forward a petition to the United Nations signed by a lot of people on this panel to have Canada lead and support the convention. We were very encouraged when the Canadian delegate to the United Nations announced that the door was open for Canadian support. In other words, it was under consideration. In May 2020, 
the Secretary General of the United Nations, wrote an, an important policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on older people around the world. Now, I'm proud to say that our government was instrumental in getting 147 countries to sign on and support this document, which calls for a stronger legal framework at international levels to protect the rights of older persons. We must support this. We also are support the speech from the throne announcements on long-term care standards that the minister mentioned, the criminal code changes to address neglect in long-term care, actions to keep people in home longer, at home longer, and measures for personal support workers. We need to learn to grow from the treatment of seniors in this pandemic. And we hope that Canada will continue its long, proud history to support human rights at home and at the United Nations. We hope Canada will not only open the door to a convention, but walk through and support and hopefully lead the convention. Think again of those older people impacted by COVID-19 in Canada. Each of them had the right to life. They had the right to freedom of violence and abuse and the right to family. To borrow loosely from Hillary Clinton, older people's rights are human rights. Time is of the essence. We cannot afford to wait and there is no best before date on human rights. All Canadians need to ensure those rights are lifelong. They start at birth and they end at death. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, you are right. We should all be absolutely outraged by what happened in long-term care and what our Canadian forces uncovered. And the stories have just been absolutely horrific. And the lack of dignity and, and proper treatment should, should remind us all that we cannot let this go. So thank you. Um, next, I am going to introduce Greg Shaw with the uh, International Federation of Aging. Greg, hello. Hi, Cynthia, thank you very much. Um, and I also want to recognize that it's not only Canada's National Seniors Day, it is also the International Day for Older Persons Worldwide being 1 October. It really is a remarkable coming together of the world to recognize and value older people across the globe. As people can hear, I uh, was, originally Australian, but I am now Canadian. But I always think that I'm coming into some of these conversations, it's deja vu for me. As a former Deputy Minister with the Department of Health and Ageing in Australia, conversations that you have in Canada today, we had in Australia 30 years ago. Issues around standards, quality of care, home care, all of those things were discussed and put in place um, 30 years ago, and we're far behind many developed countries in the delivery of long-term care and home care. But I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're really interested in about making Canada more age-inclusive or age-friendly. And I want to talk specifically about influenza and vaccines. And Influenza is the most common infectious disease, second now to COVID-19, that kills up to around 650 people every year. Older adults and those with underlying health conditions are, have or have a compromised immune system are especially at risk of serious life-threatening complications compared to the general population. Immunisation is one of the most effective public health measures against infectious disease second only to clean water. Isn't that remarkable? Second only to clean water. Despite national influenza vaccine programs and campaigns timed to optimise protection across all ages, vaccine coverage rate amongst older people generally remain poor. And that certainly could be said for Canada. If vaccine uptake rates are the main indicator of national campaigns, then they are mediocre at best with little or no published research or either on the effectiveness or the effectiveness of awareness raising messages and or the impact of the dis distribution pipeline for those messages. Given the profound underuse of vaccination among the general public, but the most importantly, those at greatest risk, there is a real and urgent need to improve messages and campaigns towards older people taking action to be vaccinated with confidence. And that's certainly the case 
for Canada and most countries across the world. And for this, the IFA just recently has published 10 reports, countrywide reports on, uh, the report is called Changing the Conversation on Adult Influenza Vaccine Vaccination. And it really is a groundbreaking study conducted by the IFA on the status of campaigns focused on the most vulnerable members of our populations, older people and those with underlying conditions. The study showed unequivocally that insufficient attention is paid to implementing effective public health campaigns. And here in Canada, it's even further complicated to a large degree because most, most, most public health campaigns are of a national nature, whereas here in Canada, it's both national and provincial. So the National Immunisation Plan in Canada comprising a national vaccine registry, a single immunisation schedule, and harmonised delivery and access to vaccine is yet to be realised despite decades of calls for action. So it was interesting, again, in the throne speech, we're talking about a national pharma care system. So I've often said that depending on where you live and you, your access not only to vaccines, but other medications, as an older person, you can be discriminated against. So Canada discriminates against its older people in not only access to vaccines, access to priority one drugs, access to long-term care, community care, fees, and those sorts of structures of things that older people are wanting. Although vaccine recommendations are made at a national level, decisions regarding the implementation of new vaccines um, into public funded programs is primarily the provincial or territory responsibility. So, and an interesting, interestingly, across all 12 provinces and territories, for influenza, it's a free vaccine for people over the age of 65. Yet, Quebec, you've got to be 75 before it's free. So my question is, are Quebecers more healthy than the rest of the Canadian population? And my guess would be, no, they're not. So public communication on influenza and the importance of vaccination is a shared responsibility between the federal and provincial governments in Canada and public health authorities. In broad terms, the federal government has set out a coordinated communication strategy calling on guiding jurisdictions to work together, but that doesn't necessarily happen. So how do we actually improve vaccine uptake rates and get provinces to work together better? Maybe it is a national pharma care system. But um, the 10 country, country study report that we did, just to let you know, was a comparison on, on the Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, England, France, Germany, Japan, South Korea and USA on what is the public messaging that is going out around influenza, annual influenza. And it's been a very comprehensive review of those marketing messages. And it's not the same. It's not coordinated. It's very different. And we've got a scorecard now for um, those countries. And, interest, and interesting, they look at comprehensive policies and programs, and certainly we've got a green. So in Canada, we're pretty good. Clear communication strategies, again, uh, pretty good. Um, where we fall down is um, comprehensive policies. We don't have a national system. So it depends on where you live. Um, Well-defined audience, again, dedicated and tailored information to specific risk, uh, at risk groups is limited or limiting. So they don't have the same public health messaging. Where we don't do very well is uh, interactive communication, including individual consultation, street campaigns, and face-to-face mobilisation around adult vaccines and influenza. And this really is, is at the heart of how can we, as a country, improve vaccine uptake rates, particularly as we know that it's the best public health method, method, method we can have, second only to clean water. So that is my comments. Uh, but it's not only vaccines, it's other access to medication where we don't do it very well in this country. Thank you. Back Thank to you, you Cynthia. Much. Thank you. Very disturbing to hear we're 30 years behind uh, where Australia was. You know, I had a senior not too long ago say to me, when it comes to a pending, hopefully pending COVID vaccine, will seniors get it first? 
we're the most vulnerable, but will we be, will, we be, will we be valued and be at the front of the line for this COVID vaccine when it, when it arrives? And I thought that that was a very interesting uh, point and they did not feel that they would be first in line. So a little disturbing that they don't feel that valued. Um, next, our next panelist is Gregor Snedden with Help Age Canada. Hello. Hi, thank you, uh, Cynthia, and welcome, and thank you to all our panelists and friends joining us today across Canada. Well, <clears throat> I'm kind of echoing a little bit what our other panelists have said, but uh, you know, a help, an, an age-inclusive Canada is also an age-inclusive world. I mean, if you can imagine life expectancy globally has climbed from not much more than 30 a century ago to over 70 now and over 80 in first world countries like Canada. It's just a few generations ago and the world has not had a moment to self-reflect on what it means to have the fastest growing glo global population being older people. We are becoming aware of our own judgment and prejudice towards older people, ageism, a lens we put on and which characterizes and often dismisses older people as participants in the consumer and productivity driven society that we live in. So I'd like to focus my comments on two ideas uh, towards an age inclusive Canada, values and voice. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic awakened Canadians to the plight of older people, as we've heard. We, we were all shocked by witnessing the deplorable conditions in long-term care homes and over 80%, I think it might even be closer to 82% of all COVID-19 deaths occurred and the extreme isolation and loneliness older people experience that physical distancing has exasperated. But, you know, it's natural and easy for us to point fingers and to blame. And policymakers, decision makers, and government certainly have an accountability to lead, protect, and to serve. But it's from the values of society, our values, that policy, leadership, and changes emerge. Where our treasure is, that's where our heart is also, someone once said. So it's, it's my first thought on an age-inclusive Canada is searching and addressing our shared values as Canadians. Is economic prosperity to be placed above the value of the human person? Is productivity and GDP the only measure of success? Is the value of my personal economic freedom more important than social safety for the vulnerable and marginalized, the sacredness of life of, of all people? But those are the values that elect our officials and make our choices and uh, drive our action and activity in the world. And as Margaret Gillis was, was pointing out, the UN Convention on the Rights of Older People is a great place to engage with our own assumptions and to participate in making positive change. The UN Convention on the Rights of Older People can help change values, attitudes and behaviors and influence how we shape the future together as opposed to blaming and pointing our fingers. fingers. We're all responsible to influence and make these changes as a society. The, the second area where I'd like to suggest is critical for an age inclusive Canada is to provide the means to give older people voice. I, I use the word voice at, at Help Age as about older people's ability to claim their rights, to make choices, and to participate meaningfully in decision-making in all parts of their lives including the personal, family, social, and political. It's also about older people's ability to challenge ageism and inequality. Falling into ageism, which I think I would suggest we, we all do to some extent, we can often see older people as victims only to be helped, which is a false assumption. Older people must have the space to participate fully, and critical to that space is access. Specifically, I believe this is to create the means for older people to engage with the world in the way that most of us take for granted through technology. Even this wonderful event today, we, uh, most older people can't even par can't participate because they don't have the means or access to participate in a Zoom call. For most older people, Digital technology is not something they grew up with. It's often foreign, uncomfortable, unintuitive, even intimidating. And for many older people, it's just not accessible for a number of reasons. 
And digital literacy is concerned with providing education and positive experience, support and access to digital technology and communication, and giving people the confidence to use these tools. As an age-inclusive Canada has the means for older people to participate fully, to have voice and agency, and in our privileged country of Canada, that presumes access and utility with the privilege of technology and contemporary communication. I mean, think about it. It's only a handful of people in the village that had an indoor plumbing only not too long ago, or a car, or a radio, and then a television, then a microwave. In my generation, there were cars being made without seat belts. And now our way of being together as a society has moved to a new privileged capacity facilitated by a technological revolution where a landline telephone and a telephone book are history. And we need to provide that means for all people to participate in those means. So an age-inclusive Canada, in, in my view, must address values and voice, challenging and shaping our values together towards older people as a society and providing digital literacy and access to technology to all seniors that they too may participate with voice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, that talk. I appreciate it. I'm going to move on to our next panelist, Dr. Alex Mihalidis. I hope I pronounced that properly. Dr. Alex, uh, he is with AgeWell. Great. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and good afternoon to all of our fellow panelists and everyone who attended. The use of technology was on the rise before the pandemic. Now AgeWell polling data is showing that technology use has increased significantly for older adults as they're encouraged to shelter in place and limit physical contact with others. The reliance on technology is something we have all experienced as we work from home, study online, or limit how we gather with our friends and family. I want you to come away with three core ideas after today. First, seniors are increasingly tech savvy and looking for technology products to improve their daily lives. Second, in order to meet this need in an equitable way, we need to consider access to technology as a human right, where we invest in technology development and infrastructure, including high-speed internet, in order to address the digital determinants of health of all Canadians. Third, AgeWell is aligned with CanAge in driving systems change in this space. From social media to food delivery apps and fitness trackers, older Canadians have ramped up their use of many technologies and online services during the COVID-19 pandemic. An AgeWell poll conducted by Enveronics Research showed that about a quarter of Canadians aged 65 or older now use video calling on their smartphones twice as many as in 2019. In fact, six in 10 of them report increased use due to COVID-19. Furthermore, over a quarter of Canadian seniors use social media for health, wellness, and independence, 42% of them once again reporting increased use due to COVID-19. With these findings, we can set aside any notion that older adults are technophobic. They are unfazed by technology for the most part. COVID-19 is clearly a catalyst that is taking tech use to a new level for Canadian seniors. This is why as Canada's Technology and Aging Network, AgeWell will continue to co-create solutions alongside seniors and their caregivers to ensure that the products that make it to the market are relevant, user-friendly, and make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. Let's talk about equitable access to technology. In order for all older Canadians to have access to technology solutions, we also need to consider the digital determinants of health. These are things like high-speed internet infrastructure, digital health literacy, and integration of digital tools into community and health services. Over two-thirds of Canadians over the age of 50 agree that technological advancements can help to lessen the impact of COVID-19 on daily life. The majority agree that accordingly with help, they can maintain their relationships with family and friends, reduce social isolation, pursue hobbies, manage health, and maintain their independence. Of course, the technology solutions are not enough. Although our data shows that older adults are increasingly tech savvy, 
Many of them still turn to family and friends to help them with installation and troubleshooting of new tech. This means dig digital literacy programs are paramount to ensuring an equitable access to devices that facilitate social engagement, healthcare visits, and the ordering of groceries and other supplies online. Not only do we need programming through libraries, schools, and communities that allow for intergenerational connection and learning, but we also need the physical infrastructure that establishes access to technology as a right for every older Canadian, regardless of their income, race, or place of living. Finally, we are excited to bring these age-friendly solutions into the real world with the help of partners like CanAge and others. AgeWell is driving the age tech sector in Canada by building capacity across the innovation pipeline from early stage research to testing, commercialization, and implementation in the real world. We are working with partners in homes and long-term care who are eager to incorporate new solutions to improve the experiences of their residents and clients. A glimpse of the future can be found in our eight challenge areas developed through extensive consultation with Canadian seniors, researchers, industry, and policymakers, as outlined in our Future of Technology and Aging Agenda, which closely aligns with the Voices Roadmap. Whether it is building supportive homes and communities, developing rapid learning health systems, or improving how seniors stay connected, AgeWell is helping the sector learn from the hard lessons that the COVID-19 crisis and sparking change. We will continue to show that age tech researchers and entrepreneurs have the enormous potential to improve all of our lives as we age and create jobs and economic growth at a time when we need it the most. Thank you very much for having us and thank you very much for the time. Thank you so very much. And last but not least, uh, let's t turn this over to the incredible Laura Tamblin Watts, who has been leading the charge in the media on, on many of these issues and a leading voice uh, through COVID and raising awareness about what needs to be done for seniors. Laura. Thanks, Cynthia. That's very generous. And I just want to say that the team at CanAge has been working tirelessly during COVID-19, as I'm sure all of my panelists and those of you who are on our call today. I just want to recognize that the community effort to respond to the pressing needs of COVID-19 has been really quite a remarkable matter. I just want to spare just a few minutes before we engage in our discussion and share with you what are some of the key issues that CanAge is engaging on? And in order to do that, I am going to encourage folks, if you have a chance to go on to our website at canage.ca slash voices, and you will see a nonpartisan, you know, unbiased representation of what Canada needs to move forward and be more age inclusive. We know how challenging it is for people to say it's too big a problem. We just don't know where to start. How can I play a role with my community in my family or my government or my region or my not-for-profit organization? How can I as an academic or I as a stakeholder or I as a guy who lives around the corner and is worried about his mom, how can we play a coherent role so we're actually moving the needle in making Canada more age-inclusive? And I just want to recognize the work of our team and the hundreds of stakeholder and consultations that we did across this country. We folded in the best of our evidence-based research. We folded in the inquiries and commissions and all of the work that we have done in Canada. And I hope that you will see the work that you have done, our participants here represented in that. So we created something that's very easy to navigate. Six compass points. Within those compass points, you'll see that there are 40 issues and expand those issues and you will see 135 recommendations. We encourage you to spend a bit of time and indicate where your area is. I know that in the chat, we've been helping to navigate a little bit where some of the comments that our stakeholders and our guests today have been referring to within their own contributions. I'm also just going to put a last minute plug in, please. This is a kickoff to a free conference. That's what it is, really. And we're hosting events 
for the next three days. So tomorrow, and I'll just give the times in Eastern uh, because I know that we could be spending a lot of time saying it in every jurisdiction. In Eastern time tomorrow, we start off looking at the V invoices, violence and abuse prevention from 11 to 12.30. Half an hour break in between 1 and 2.30, we look at the O invoices, optimal health and well-being. That's our acute, chronic, and preventive care. What do we need to do around our well-being? You get the weekend off, and then on Monday morning, we start looking and building on some of the work, and Greg Shaw is participating in that one as well, as we address the issue of infection prevention and disaster response. The afternoon, between twelve, uh, between 1 and 2.30, we're looking at the issue that's been so front and center of all of our minds, caregiving, home care, long-term care, and housing, that health and housing continuum. We wrap up on Tuesday, October 6, exploring the issue of economic security. We know that it is a very financially uncertain time. And what do we need to do to make sure that we are expanding the issue about age inclusivity? And I know one of our questions is talking about workforce inclusion today. We wrap up with social inclusion, and we know that we both invite back folks from HelpAge and some of their organizations, as well as Kahir is going to be talking a bit more with some of our other folks from across this country. I hope that you will join us for our free webinar series as we explore these issues, and you will hear voices that are diverse that are rural, that are remote. You will hear voices of Indigenous elders. We will hear new Canadians. You will hear experts in their field. So how can we make Canada more age inclusive? I am going to ask that all of you join us for our exploration, spend a bit of time with the roadmap, and then reach out and let us know what you're doing. At the very end of the wrap up, we've got a couple of areas that you can activate on, and I'll share that with you at the end. But thank you. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. We're going to get right into questions now because we know that we have a lot of really good ones. People that, you know, have, have their uh, voices that they want to share. So Diana Cable, who is the executive director of policy or director of policy and advocacy with CanAge. Diana, could you, could you lead us with the first question? Um, James Ellis. And uh, he says, under the banner of age inclusion, many of our members at the Rotary Dial Connection who are in the 65 to 75 group and are still wanting to continue their full-time careers, but many employers are turning them away, seemingly based on their age. Is this an issue that the panel can comment on and suggest solutions? That's such a good question. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to jump in first. Kahir, maybe, would, would you care to, to start this off? Sure. You know, when we look at the delivery of programs, the creation of policies, I think it's important for us to understand uh, and call out inherent ageism that, that exists across different platforms uh, and whether that's the workforce or whether that's in the insurance and legal uh, industry, we need to open the conversation. Uh, and collectively advocate for addressing um, barriers, I would say, and some are structural and some are systemic uh, in, uh, based on, you know, not just age, but ability or, or orientation or ethnicity. And I think it's part of a conversation of creating more inclusive and holistic programs uh, and, and services. Margaret, what? Oh, Laura, you've got your hand up. Thank you. I got you before, Margaret. My apologies, but I know that Margaret, I think, will, uh, will speak as well to some of the human rights. It is a fundamental uh, denial of human rights, and thank you so much for, for sharing that. We often don't think about age. We kind of think it's okay not to hire older people, and there's been study after study after study, and I would call particularly to your attention the work of the AARP, the World Economic Forum, and the OECD, and that's included in our workplace inclusion recommendation uh, 112 in our voices uh, talking about reducing barriers to hiring an age inclusive workforce as well as promoting opportunities for older workers to return to the workforce. We also recommend in diversity and inclusion policies of hiring practices and HR. We are asking that very specifically age has to be included in diversity and inclusion hiring policies so that can be challenged. So that's some of our thoughts, James, but we really understand that this is an ongoing issue of inherent ageism. And Margaret, would you like to weigh in? 
Sure. Um, Laura, you're dead right. This is a human rights violation. It would be part of a, a convention on the rights of older persons. But um, the other part about it is uh, we really need to just rethink how we see older people. And it's a really basic um, rights issue. And I think part of having a convention is, is seeing people as rights holders. But we need to be part of that story, you know, in the country anyhow. Um, the fact that people are getting away with this is absolutely disgraceful, and we all know it. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like women in the 1960s. We need it to stop, and we need to harass and embarrass those who do it, uh, including perhaps taking uh, legal measures, because it's absolutely outrageous that it's allowed to go on. I think there's a stigma, though, against older people. There really is, and, and they are seen as less valuable and... And in this country, in other cultures, they, they don't have that stigma the same way we, that we seem to here in North America. Uh, Diana, I think, let's get right to our next question. I'm going to read this one from the chat. It's from Mark Shimkovitz. And he says, as a financial advisor, I've seen the risks that seniors face in terms of financial elder abuse. Do any of the panelists have tools or strategies to help in drawing awareness to this and the prevention of it. Yeah, that's my area. Thanks very much. I appreciate that, Mark, and I am happy to, happy to answer that, both in terms of talking about some of the very specific aspects of the V, and you'll see that there are financial issues as well. The answer is yes, there's some great tools out there. I'll share with you that from the Canadian Securities Administrators Association, so the CSA is starting to bring in regulatory rules around required awareness for and response to financial elder abuse and IROC, the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, is going to be talking about that on our E section on economic uh, security. So I encourage you to jump in on the E and the V sections as we're going to be exploring that. I would also encourage you to look at the NICE network. So N-I-C-E-N-E-T dot C-A and look at their tools around elder abuse. The last thing I would recommend is go to IFIC, I-F-I-C dot C-A. And IFIC, we did a bunch of tools for financial advisors and about elder abuse. I think those will be useful to you. All right, Diana, let's get right to the next question. From Kathleen Edwards. Well, I don't want to downplay the negativity tied to COVID-19 and long-term care. There were also some excellent stories that demonstrated how communities and stakeholders were resilient and came together in innovative ways. This led to the form formation of partnerships between these groups who may not usually, sorry, my screen is scrolling, who may not usually work together for a common cause. How can we continue this collaboration moving forward after the pandemic? How will this united effort lend support to advocacy and advancing policy? It's a very good question. And you don't want to, to lose out on ground that has been made, progress that has been made. Um, Kahir, I'm guessing perhaps you might be a good one to start this discussion off. Yeah, I'll start with maybe a couple opening remarks and I'll let some of my colleagues fill in some of the blanks here. But, you know, I think it's important for us to, to think through um, the, the value of, of, uh, and power of collective voice uh, and really looking at elevating the conversation to what is in the best interest of, of the people that we're serving uh, and looking at reimagining uh, the current way of, of working. You know, one of the things that the pandemic has taught us in, in the world of community is that innovation uh, and, and shifting and being able to pivot to be responsive to emerging needs has been a, a real strength uh, of, of different types of sectors um, that, that serve older people. And so the, 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 the idea of authentic collaboration, I use the word authentic intentionally, uh, is important for us to co-create and reimagine uh, some of the work that's been happening and, and share best practice or promising practices around what is working and what isn't working and, and, and being generous with our knowledge and time around certain key issues. Greg, what are your thoughts on this? Seeing as, as, as you pointed out that we are so far behind. It's interesting because I was on a webinar, um, a European webinar um, a few days ago. And there's been a couple of studies being done around the impact on older people, particularly around isolation and loneliness um, in lockdown. And one of the studies has shown, and I think it was a Netherlands study, had shown that older people in long-term care during the lockdown certainly felt isolated. But did they feel lonely? 
No, they were very positive around loneliness because in most cases, the increased contact rates that they had with family members was 50% higher than in non-lockdown periods. So families were being much more proactive in keeping in contact with mum, whether it was through the iPad or phone calls, rather than through contact visits. So I think that's something that, how do we actually keep that going post COVID so that families are still connecting, if it's not physically uh, in person, they're still connecting electronically with their loved one in long-term care. And I think that really has been a good thing for the whole long-term care system because they really have had to look at how do we actually get communication systems in place for loved ones in long-term care. So there's, there's been some benefits as well. But don't think that um, um, loneliness, um, isolation leads to loneliness in long-term care because it certainly has shown that it hasn't. That's fascinating. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Alex, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, I think, you know, technology, again, can play a role in, in all this. Um, you know, in terms of connecting individuals, uh, no matter who they're trying to connect with, you know, that there are tools that already exist. Um, we're showing through the data that we've collected from across Canada that, that seniors are willing to use this technology. And the one thing we also need to keep in mind is that, you know, the, the senior population is changing. That, um, you know, it's going to be a far more tech-savvy um, cohort that's coming in. It's going to be a, a new cohort of, of older people who expect technology to be part of their lives in every single way, uh, whether it's from financial uh, literacy to, again, reducing social isolation or connecting with uh, their loved ones. And so that's something that, you know, Canada has to be prepared for. And to be honest, we're not prepared for it as of yet. And so there's still a lot of work that has to to happen across all areas where technology can play a role. And, and what needs to be done to push to drive that forward? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to infrastructure. Um, so again, allowing people to have the right infrastructure, uh, access to the internet, um, not just access, but access to it in a, in a way that's economically feasible for everyone. Um, you know, I did see one question in the Q&A of someone who talked about the, the COVID app that got, was put up by the federal government that is not back compatible with older phones. And many older people do have older phones. And so right there, you know, they're not able to access the essential services that our government is trying to get across. So, um, you know, so a lot of it does come down to infrastructure and allowing the services to be provided uh, in a reasonable way. Okay. And Gregor, I saw you sort of putting up your virtual hand. You have something you want to add in? Yeah, just to add, you know, I, 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 I agree. You know, we, we have statistics that I just was looking at yesterday that over 60% of, of, of people uh, 65 plus in 2018 have a smartphone and 21.2% check the smartphone at least every 30 minutes. So we, we do see, of course, a, a growing technical uh, savvy uh, older population. However, especially for many rural communities, uh, low income uh, seniors, technology still remains very inaccessible and difficult to access, whether that's through data, devices themselves, and, and most importantly across the board is the way that, that, that we learn together. Uh, it's not about, you know, giving someone a tablet with a manual or a video. It's about that one-on-one -on -one experience. Uh, Help Age Canada is engaged with uh, Connected Canadians, an organization, and we've just launched a national tablet uh, digital literacy program. And our experience is, is the, the ability to really develop and work closely one-on-one -on -one with older people in developing the confidence and capacity to use that technology. So just although I agree that we are growing uh, tech, uh, as a technologically savvy older population, we still have a long way to go in making that accessible and providing the tools to, to learn and develop that capacity. All right. Thank you very much. And I hate to say it, but this hour and a half has just flown by and it's time to wrap up and I'm going to send it over to Laura Tamblin-Watts uh, for her final thoughts on this. Laura. 
Thank you so much for sharing with us National Seniors Day in Canada and International Seniors Day. Our expert panel has dug into the most wonderful, wonderful ways in which we can be more age inclusive. You know, a key moment for me was that welcome from Carrie. I, I confess I, I got a little choked up, Carrie, when you were talking about how the song of Canada, and this is so much of that and what we can learn from the world of uh, many cultures and many communities, including the Métis community, I think is going to help to frame our conversation. So thank you so much for that incredibly meaningful welcome, Kerry. I really also want to make sure that I thank Cynthia Mulligan. Cynthia has been a tireless journalist and advocate at the very front end of sharing the stories of older people. And I know that she has been incredibly engaged as well during the time of COVID-19, but has been a voice raising up the issues of elder abuse when many, many are not. A deep and profound thank you to you, Cynthia. For our team who has put this fantastic series together, thank you. And I would be absolutely remiss if I did not share with you great information. Please be in contact with us. Join CanAge. It's free. We would love you to join. So it's canage.ca slash join. Again, a big thank you to our co-presenting agency, Help Age Canada, and all of our sponsors. Again, you get a free membership if you join, and we'll make sure that you get all the information to keep in the loop. Again, don't forget our free conference series, jumping off tomorrow Eastern at 11 to 12.30 with wonderful folks from across the country. The BC Seniors Advocate is joining us. We've got folks from Newfoundland and everywhere in between. And in the afternoon, we are addressing the healthcare issues. As you know, wrapping around to Monday and Tuesday, we start looking at the IC and ES invoices. Don't forget to join. And again, please share all this wonderful information. Your voices are important as we raise the voices of Canada's seniors. Thank you for joining everybody. We appreciate it and have a wonderful National Seniors Day.